when we made Evil Dead, I wanted to make, do something that... <laughs> <laughs> comes from the woods, this dark and brooding entity, and surrounds the cabin that they're in, and one by one it possesses them, and their eyes go white, and they're jerked about like marionettes, and they're forced against one another, and uh, it's a love story. Uh, no, it's not a love story, but it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. In 1981, after a lengthy and arduous independent production, during which the director, his partners, cast and crew, faced many ups and downs getting their first ever feature film put together, a landmark in the horror genre was released. Or let's say, unleashed into cinemas, the original Evil Dead. Unlike its sequels, the arguably superior horror comedy funhouse that was Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn, and the third, Army of Darkness, a fantasy horror comedy with very little of the horror, the original was intended as a full-on terrifying experience. It is a rock'em sock'em roller coaster ride of uh, screaming horror. A movie that, to horror buffs like myself, probably needs no introduction. The Evil Dead was directed by a then unknown, but now blockbuster-making director, Sam Raimi, whom you might know from several of his films, but the most widely popular would definitely be his time helming the Spider-Man movies in the Web Slinger's first big screen incarnation. Growing up in a suburb of Detroit, Sam and his childhood friends were enthralled with the world of film from a young age. Between them, they made several of their own Super 8 movies. And though these early experiments as filmmakers started off simple, they became increasingly elaborate as time wore on. Many of these earlier films were a collaboration with his childhood friend, Scott Spiegel, and included many inspired by a favorite of the duo, The Three Stooges, a love that would reflect more in the Evil Dead sequels. And speaking of sequels, Spiegel would later go on to co-write the second Evil Dead film, and cameo in Spider-Man 2. But it wouldn't be until some years later before they would make horror movie history deep in the woods of the Tennessee mountains. Even through high school and into college, Raimi kept making Super 8 movies, along with his friend, theater student Bruce Campbell, and joined by his brother Ivan's roommate, Robert Tappert, who quickly became fast friends with his roomie's younger, impish brother, they even found some success showing their student films, managing to make a profit from some of their early efforts. Which got the gears in the more business-minded Tappert's head turning. It was about time they tried to make a full-length feature film. Something that got their eyes on the horror genre was a surprise scare at the end of their biggest production at the time. The otherwise allegedly goofy, It's Murder. The effectiveness of this last part in the film, a project Raimi and co. were otherwise ultimately disappointed in, got them working in that direction, thanks to the excitement a good scare could elicit in an audience. And soon, they found themselves at the late-night drive-ins and grindhouses of the day, researching as many horror films as they could, so that they better understood what was and wasn't effective to audiences at the time, as well as what they wanted to do differently. Under their production company name, Renaissance Pictures, they resolved to make a splattered horror picture that was as relentless and fresh as possible. Most of the time, we would watch films, and they didn't deliver enough. That's what we felt. So we wanted to make one that would really uh, knock them with a punch. But before 16mm film began shooting on the Evil Dead, a proof-of-concept short version was cobbled together, with the hope that it would attract an investor so they could go on to make the full version. This short film was called Within the Woods, and follows more or less the same basic plot beats as the Evil Dead. Now a cult short film in its own right, Within the Woods was never released officially, and to my knowledge has only been available to watch at a super crappy quality bootleg. Join us. By showing this experiment to potential investors, they were able to raise enough to begin. With a script originally titled Book of the Dead, written by Raimi and dubbed The Ultimate Experience in Grueling Terror, a tagline that would be used in much of the film's marketing. Sam and co. found a location in the woods of Tennessee, and soon production was set to begin at last. There are many, I think, 
aside from the uber horror aficionados who may not realize that the making of Evil Dead 1 was a grueling experience in itself, and the creativity of Raimi and co. helped bring it to life in a way that only enhances the film. The movie begins with a group of college friends from Michigan State University, where Simon and Rob attended in real life, driving along in the car that has appeared in nearly every Raimi-related production, the Delta 88, on their way to an old cabin in the woods, where they are vacationing together. A setup far too familiar in many horror films which followed, before Camp Crystal Lake became a destination over and over again, or before we spent time at Sleepaway Camp, or even a slew of other camps and cabins or a certain other cabin in the woods, decades later. This cabin was not their first choice, as the original scouted location's owners got cold feet at the last minute. The cabin they used was a real, abandoned cabin that they had to clean out and make suitable for filming. This included retrofitting the whole place to make room for lights, as well as digging a six-foot-deep hole underneath to represent the entrance to the cabin's cellar, an important location in the movie. According to the Evil Dead Journal, an account of the production by crew member Josh Becker, a friend of Raimi and Campbell's from the Super 8 days, and future director himself, and referenced in this awesome book, The Evil Dead Companion, by Bill Warren, and also from tales told by Sam himself, the locals in Tennessee considered the location haunted. It later burned to the ground, and depending on who is asked, the cause was different, with Sam in particular spinning quite the tale involving lightning storms and ghostly occurrences. Later tales claim that the cabin was burned down by Sam himself when filming concluded, and indeed the previously referenced journals by Becker, as well as later interviews, speak of a large bonfire being held by the remaining crew which, to quote Rob Tappert, got out of hand. Things just got out of hand. However, a connection between the two burnings has never been proven, and indeed it did eventually come to light that the place was burned down sometime later by squatters. It is said only parts of the stone chimney remain today, from which some devoted fans have even retrieved bricks, according to Campbell, for him to sign. And speaking of fans meeting Bruce Campbell, if you'll forgive me for bragging just a moment. One of my coolest convention-going memories was when Thunder Kitty and I got to meet the man himself back in 2014, and have him sign my Necronomicon DVD copy of the movie. He was super chill, and a fun guy in person too, and even when we were posing for pictures, he wanted to have a little fun with it. Hail to the king, baby. After arriving at the cabin and settling in for some dinner and whatever that is they're drinking, the gang soon discover the creepy old cellar below and investigate. After some shenanigans with a shotgun, <laughs> they find an ancient book bound in human flesh along with a matching dagger to complete the set, as well as an old tape recorder that they all decide to take upstairs and listen to, which is a great idea, of course. It is revealed through the recording that the cabin once belonged to an archaeology professor studying the creepy old tome, the Necronomicon, or as it's called in this movie, Noturam de Monto, aka the Book of the Dead. The tape continues as the professor reads from the blood-inked words in the book. And before they listen to Cheryl and... The Dark Kandarian Incantations summon something evil into the woods. Before long, all bloody, gooey hell breaks loose, rarely letting up until the film's climax. Starring as the lead in this film, Ashley, or Ash for short, is Campbell himself making him serve as both producer and actor on the project. Although stories from behind the scenes go to show that the man not only contributed that to the movie, but also blood, sweat, and probably some other bodily fluids. Incredible demands were placed upon Bruce while we were shooting the picture. Physically, it was tough. Um, you know, you do maybe 10 takes or something, and the first one was the best, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't really know that till editing. For about 80% of the film, he's covered in blood and it keeps becoming more and more and more blood. This handsome young gentleman sitting over to my left is Bruce Campbell, who is the actor that you just saw drenched with blood in that clip, and he is uh, the star. That's right, you get top billing in The Evil Dead. Somebody's got to. Well, I won't say that that may or may not have been influenced by the fact that Bruce is also an associate producer on the film and no, one we, of we the three. We don't talk oh, about oh, that. Okay.
Not to mention going above and beyond in many set-related tasks throughout, including the unfortunate task of helping to shovel out piles and piles of manure that had been left in the abandoned cabin set when they moved in. Manure! I hate manure! Rounding out the supporting cast were a slew of other unknowns and independent actors just starting out in their careers. Playing Ash's sister Cheryl is a high school friend of Raimi's, Ellen Sandweiss, who also co-starred in the aforementioned Within the Woods, as well as some of the duo's Super 8 outings. Also along for the ride is Ash's girlfriend, Linda, played by Betsy Baker. And friends, Scotty and his girlfriend Shelly, played by Richard DeManicor, billed as Hal Delrich, and Teresa Tilly, billed as Sarah York, respectively. These latter two were fresh into the Screen Actors Guild and went by these pseudonyms to avoid any backlash the little gory film would inflict upon their careers. Unfortunately, this strategy didn't work as the two of them were found out and as a result received fines and temporary suspension from the guild because of it. So, um, you know, I'm down there making the movie going, ah, oh, you know what, no one's ever gonna see this thing. I'll just put a different name on it and it, it'll be fine. I was suspended from the union for six months. And let's not forget many stand-ins that were required, especially after filming continued rolling after the actors left. These extras were dubbed fake Shemps, a nod to how when Three Stooges actor Shemp Howard passed away and they were forced to complete some of his partially shot material with lookalikes and faceless stand-ins. Even Sam's younger brother, aspiring actor Ted, who would later become a fan favorite on Renaissance Pictures produced TV series Xena Warrior Princess, had to fill in. See, there he is. And even Sam and Rob can be spotted as the hitchhikers down the road. I'll go to hell. I'm not honking at you. The evil force roaming the woods, as summoned by the book, possess Ash's friends and loved ones, turning them into what later entries in the series would dub Deadites. And as he is terrorized throughout the bloody night, he must cling to his sanity as the film becomes more and more surreal with him facing off against his friends as they fall one by one to the evil, becoming nothing more than monstrous, maniacal shells of their former selves that can only be defeated through violent and vicious means of bloody bodily dismemberment. And even that might not be enough for Ash to fend off the ancient force awakened by the Necronomicon. Much of this latter section of the movie was shot after the principal cast and crew left, with only a few remaining, including Becker, who continued chronicling the production to carry on. There was also said to be a lot of drama and discontentment going on throughout the ranks as principal photography lengthened, and the exhaustive conditions didn't help make life easier for them. Several of the cast and crew often worked 18 to 20 hour days, with sleep deprivation setting in. Raimi actually fell asleep up in the crane they were using to film one of the scenes in the movie, and it wasn't discovered until later. All of them also endured freezing temperatures for months, with no heat or running water in the abandoned cabin set, resorting to burning pieces of furniture once the interior scenes had been shot to keep warm. Before that, what local moonshine they didn't drink themselves was also thrown on the fire to fuel the flames. Sam has talked about washing his hands in hot coffee in order to clean them enough to reload the film into the camera. And wash your hands in the scalding coffee. I remember doing that many times. Ugh, it was horrible. When they would inevitably get covered with the gore and grime of the long day of filming, namely the sticky caro syrup, which by then was everywhere on them and the set. The cast and crew also endured their own fair share of injuries and mishaps throughout the guerrilla style shoot. And many a tale in particular has been told about Bruce's torment often at the hands of his friends. Bruce was a chump. He sprained his ankle one night, and Sam and I then poked it with sticks for about a week just to drive him crazy. It was the single meanest thing he and I've ever done, and very immature, but at the time it was hysterical. You bastards! Why are you torturing me like this? Why? As well as Ellen Sandweiss during her extensive running through the forest scenes, getting scratched and torn up to hell in the process. <laughs> Not to mention tons of other hard knocks the cast and crew suffered, some of which you can read, hear about, or see in some of the movie's outtakes and behind-the-scenes footage that is available out there. Many of the materials their low budget limited the Evil Dead to came with their own pains as well. The acrylic paint they resorted to using on the actors, as well as the sclera contact lenses described by Campbell as putting Tupperware over one's eyes, only added to the discomfort many of them went through for many hours at a time. 
All of that being said, the makeup, special props, and effects designed by Tom Sullivan, who had also collaborated with Raimi on Within the Woods, and is responsible for the now iconic original design of the Necronomicon, as well as all of this, did a great job with the hodgepodge of materials he had to cobble together, as well as some use of stop-motion animation, combined with composited live-action elements for a memorable sequence near the end. Running out of money, those that remained to film until the last possible minute in Tennessee finally had no choice but to return home to Michigan, where over a period of time, they had to put on their suits and go raise the remainder of the money they would need to finish the film. Having had no opportunity while filming to view the quote 75-90% of the film they'd managed to get on location, they were happy to review their work in progress and see a movie coming together. Afterward, they set to shooting the remainder, including the cellar, which was actually located on a farm owned by Tappert's family, and car interior scenes filmed in the Ramey family garage, backyards, and other such places they could utilize around home. With a score composed by Joseph Loduca, who would go on to be a mainstay in Renaissance Pictures, finally, the final cut was at last assembled by main editor Edna Ruth Paul, aided by assistant editor Joel Cohen of the Cohen Brothers, who became a friend of Raimi's around the time, and The Book of the Dead, as it was still titled at that time, had its grand premiere in Detroit, where it screened for investors, family, and locals in October of 1981. But the movie wouldn't see a wide release until 1983, but in the intermittent time, additional screenings of the movie continued to build up buzz and audience acclaim. Raimi and co. eventually took the movie to investor Irvin Shapiro, who helped them get the movie seen by potential distributors for a wider theatrical run, also known for backing another would-be horror classic, Night of the Living Dead, as well as being well-known for a long, prolific list of other titles, Shapiro's only caveat to financing the movie was that they changed the title from Book of the Dead because otherwise, people were going to think they'd have to read for 90 minutes. And so, the title of a franchise was born. As it so happened, Shapiro was one of the founders of the Cannes Film Festival and arranged for Raimi to screen the film there. Among the audience was none other than Stephen King, who loved it. Already a renowned best-selling author, his endorsement helped sell the movie, and his quote can be seen and heard on the posters and TV spots. Stephen King, author of Carrie Said, Evil Dead, is the most ferociously original horror film of the year. This prestige also helped the Evil Dead in finding a distributor in the form of then-small independent studio, New Line Cinema, or as they're now known by some, the house that Freddy built. Before long, the word got out, with additional hype and publications such as Fangoria magazine, and even a VHS release simultaneous to its theatrical launch, Renaissance Pictures' little splatter film started to take the world by storm. Evil Dead. They got up on the wrong side of the grave. Evil Dead, from New Line Cinema. Now the spawn of a whole franchise, which decades later includes a three-season TV show, Ash vs. Evil Dead. As well as video games, a musical, a sort of remake in 2013, and an upcoming remake-slash-boot, Evil Dead Rise. The one that started it all just turned 40 last year, celebrating its anniversary as a genre-pushing cult classic, and a personal favorite of mine. I often tell people it's my favorite horror movie, but when I say that, I mean it's my favorite of that decade or so. The time in which boundaries were being pushed like never before. The ideas were more daring, the content more challenging. A time otherwise known as the 80s. With Evil Dead arriving at the dawn of that era, in which thrill and shock value would be further pushed to new boundaries within the genre, giving it a shot of adrenaline fueled by Raimi's energetic style. Fresh out of college and filled with ideas from the plethora of short films he'd already made, a young Sam Raimi let this movie be his playground as you see this up-and-coming young director 
discovering and perfecting this style even at this early venture in his career. It's filled with crazy and cool, inventive camera work. Gliding and moving around, it's never sitting still for long. To achieve one wonky and particular camera angle, the director hung upside down from the cabin rafters. I had to be hanging from the ceiling by this, by this, what do you call this, underneath your knee, on a rafter. So I was actually hanging upside down with the camera like that. Bruce walked toward me and I had to actually pick my body up with my legs and then come back down. The camera is a character in the movie. The gliding POV of the demonic force zooming through the trees and preying on the protagonists. Achieved by mounting their lightweight 16mm cameras on 2x4s and simply running through the woods with a guy operating either side, allowing it to pan and move around objects, giving the motions a life of their own and creating what would become an iconic aspect of the series that would be seen or imitated throughout other films and mediums in the years that followed. Evil Dead set a new bar for frenetic camera work in horror and suspense. Naturally, the quality, as well as the care that went into the Evil Dead's contemporaries, varied greatly, and many were not without controversy. Particularly some films of B, or arguably even lesser quality, uh, or movies which challenged the audiences into viewing the grittier, bloodier side of terror. Many of which found themselves under heavy fire from older generations who just didn't get it. You just don't get it, do you? Horror films that have a lot of gore, a lot of blood, have often, in recent years, come under criticism, saying that you don't need all that to shock an audience. You don't need all that to, uh, to get a, a visceral reaction. Now, what is your response to that? We're not trying to gross them out. We're not trying to, it, it, it wasn't, well, let's, let's just put more gore in. Let's just make it gorier. It wasn't, it wasn't so much gore. It's let's try and make it scarier. Uh, gore is partially an element of it, but mm -hmm. it's not me meant to be in personally insulting. Uh, right. It's taken beyond that so that it's more into fantasy, that right. sort of thing. Because, By the way, you know, it's a monster movie. It's a debate which continues on in movies and other mediums even today, to be sure, and we won't get into that too much here. But we will mention that The Evil Dead wasn't without its own fair share of controversy, which sprung up after it hit theaters and drive-ins to much buzz among genre fans and critics alike. We discuss this because, aside from the movie's gory content, there is one scene that stands out as the elephant in the room when it comes to discussing or critiquing the Evil Dead. A scene in which, while fleeing from the force in the woods, Cheryl is attacked by the trees and assaulted by the vines in a sequence that is considered problematic by many critics to this day. Raimi himself has reflected in retrospect that the scene perhaps should have been removed or edited differently. This is evident in the sequel, which, though still featuring a similar-ish scene, does not push the arboreal assault into sexual violence territory. And it seems as if this was an attempt to keep the concept, but in a less heavy manner, as per the tone of Evil Dead 2 by comparison. According to Raimi, on the DVD commentary at least, it was Rob Tappert's idea to push the scene as far as they did, which he doesn't deny. And indeed, as many sequences in the film were, it was shot in several pieces throughout production, coming together the way it did finally in the editing room, the final result of which was even more shocking than anyone expected especially the actress. I mean, obviously I knew that the legs were gonna spread open and that the, the vines were gonna crawl up, but that final with the stick was all post-production. I had no idea until I saw it and I went. And of course at the premiere, you know, with my mother there and that was fun. Also, according to Tappert, his future wife, who just so happens to also be future Xena, Lucy Lawless, said years before meeting him that when she viewed the scene, whoever made that movie was sick. Indeed, it is my belief that this infamous moment is what makes the MPAA give the movie the NC-17 classification today as listed on many publications. Although, as aforementioned, the film's independent distribution allowed it to be released unrated, officially. There is no MPAA rating on this film, right? There's no, no RX rating. No, they liked it too much. They and they're, yeah, they liked it. And at least here in the States, most home media versions that I've seen hold that designation as well. And uh, there is a notice on the posters saying that the producers recommend that no one under the age of 17 
be allowed to f see this film. We, we don't want to kid the audience into what they're getting into, uh -huh. because we want to tell them that it is what it is. This is because when New Line submitted The Evil Dead to the MPAA for classification, it would have been slapped with an X rating. Which, due to the ratings association with pornographic films at the time, was the potential death knell for many a horror film like this one. The home video boom of the early 80s was revolutionizing the availability of such movies. Horror fandom, whether it be for more artistic fare or pure shock value, was given a new outlet to view them away from the cinema. Coupled with different censorship laws in place for the different mediums at the time of the format's infancy, this gave rise to many of these tapes ultimately being banned from various countries due to their content. And I'm not going to say all of them were good. These horror and exploitation films were branded in the UK as video nasties and were deemed illegal to sell or even view. This led to a huge clash of interest between the old generations and the new at the time, and a massive uproar during which many tapes were seized from video stores on the grounds that they were obscene. Movies ranging, as mentioned before, from the pornographic to the prolific. The video nasty craze is a topic worth looking up, if you dare, but too deep a rabbit hole to go down for this video. But there was a period of time in which The Evil Dead was blacklisted by the British government, among these other so-called video nasties. And Raimi was even called into court at one point to defend the film, where he successfully argued in the movie's case. By September of 85, The Evil Dead was off the list. Though its controversy and popularity were common companions, with many other countries banning its home video release, or only allowing for heavily censored versions well into the 2000s. Regardless, the late 70s and early 80s was an important era in the history of horror movies, giving birth to such iconic characters as Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Freddy Krueger. The shambling, flesh-eating zombies, which in recent years have infested pop culture, were also coming into their own, with the classic Dawn of the Dead, following up from the late director George Romero's equally revolutionary predecessor, the previously mentioned classic, Night of the Living Dead, which Raimi has mentioned being a big inspiration to him when conceiving of the Evil Dead due to its script's reliance on one secluded location with a small cast of characters, as well as how it was produced independently of the Hollywood system, allowing for them to push the envelope of horror into new, more gruesome directions without studio interference that often comes from a Hollywood picture. Some of the other films at the time which Raimi and co. were said to have taken note or inspiration from were the late Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And my favorites are like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, I guess, because it kept going. Once mm -hmm. it started, mm -hmm. you know, it had, it had a certain amount of opening and setup, but once it started, that's it. And late Wes Craven's The Hills Have Eyes, the latter of which has a poster cameo in the cellar of the cabin when Ash and Scotty are first down there. This was a direct reference to that film, in which a poster of Jaws is seen torn up in a scene. According to Raimi, this was his way of jokingly taking a jab at Craven, who seemed to say, forget Jaws, ours is the real horror, by doing the same in turn. This back and forth would only continue between the two, with The Evil Dead appearing on TV in Elm Street, and Freddy's glove appearing in The Evil Dead 2. As the years rolled on and a massive cult following ensued, the movie's infamy was overshadowed by its enduring status as a cult classic of the genre. Right up there with other trailblazing fellows as the aforementioned staples that came before it, and influenced many that followed. For as long as I've gushed about The Evil Dead, there's so much more I could talk about or mention. So before I bid you farewell, and a happy Halloween, I answer the question, is The Evil Dead for everyone? No, not for the squeamish for sure. And I have to add that the aforementioned tree scene may prove as a trigger for some, so consider this a warning of such. However, for fans of horror, especially from that renaissance period of the late 70s and early 80s, who love thrills and splatter in their fare, complete with resourceful, creative filmmaking that is more often effective than it isn't, and yes, cheesy as hell acting, as the cherry on top of it all, I recommend it. Really, if this seems like your thing, and you've been off living in a cabin in the middle of nowhere, stuck in the cellar perhaps, and still haven't seen it, why not check it out on a dark and spooky night?
The Evil Dead pulled no punches in its time, delivering over-the-top thrills with what they had to work with using their independent resources. But unlike many of its contemporaries, there was a level of love, ingenuity, and even artistry in what the small group of filmmakers, led by Raimi and childhood friends, producer Rob Tapper, and the legendarily groovy Bruce Campbell, were able to pull off that, in my opinion, is beyond impressive, even inspiring. Which is why, lastly, for fans of filmmaking, I also highly recommend it. For it serves as a great story of a group of aspiring filmmakers, overcoming many challenges to complete their movie and bring it to the big screen against all odds. My own fascination for the filmmaking process, the sort of creativity that can be achieved outside the Hollywood system with a low budget. What do you mean by low budget? and a passion for the project was greatly influenced in particular by the true story of its making. We set out to do something. We overcame huge hurdles and difficulties, made a movie, got it out there, got it distributed, and um, kind of went through the whole process and um, to a minor degree succeeded. And, uh, and that was kind of a testament for kids coming from, not Hollywood, but outside the Hollywood circle, that, um, that you kind of can chase your dreams, and um, if you're unrelenting in following them, uh, sometimes it works out. So it was a very young, young group of, of guys getting together and really pitching in everything they could to make the thing. The Evil Dead Companion, if you can track down a copy, is a great reference for this, as well as for the films that followed. And it's a well-known fact that many celebrated directors and writers of the genre today got their first spark of inspiration from this little horror film that could. The Evil Dead series is now as enduring as those dark spirits which roam the woods at night, as seen through countless films that followed in its bloody footsteps, and through the continued love of its many, many fans, or as we like to call ourselves, Deadites. Are you sure there's anything else? Uh... Yeah, I would like to say one other thing. And that is that uh, Steven Spielberg owes me five bucks. And I've been calling him about the thing. I've been asking him for it. I don't know why I can't get it, because I need that money. And uh, Steve, you think you'd come across with that fiber? No, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> thanks a lot, Sam. OK, thanks. <laughs>